Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Jim Zogby. Whatever the outcome of the Republican presidential primary, the candidacy of Donald Trump and the conditions that have enabled his rise have left a real mark on the party and on American politics. My guest this week is Norman Ornstein. He's resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies U.S. politics, Congress, and elections. The author of several books, including his latest, it's even worse than it looks how the American constitutional system collided with the new politics of extremism. He's contributing editor and columnist for the National Journal and the Atlantic, where his latest piece, that's what we'll talk about today, is The Eight Causes of Trumpism. Uh, thanks for joining us, Norm. Always a pleasure, Jim. Um, I want to, if you don't mind, go through the article yeah. um, section by section. Um, Although I have to say, as I read the article, there were nine factors you had, not eight. Uh, but that was, uh, you know, it was eight, and then they, uh, in the editing process, they separated out. Okay, uh, well, so. I, I'm going to have nine here yes, we'll talk about. That's fine. Um, because you're trying to account for what created the conditions yeah. that allow this individual, but also this uh, almost psychological and political yeah, moment. Exactly that allows a, a, a Trump to, mm -hmm. to emerge. Um, and the first one you point to is Newt Gingrich. And, you know, Newt actually gets mentioned a couple of times in this piece. If you go back uh, to 1978, let's time travel. Um, so Newt comes to Congress in the 1978 election. It was the third uh, time he'd run. He was a history professor at a small Georgia college. I met him right after he arrived and uh, did a series of dinners with members of that class. Newt, from the day he got to Congress, had a full-blown theory and a set of tactics to go with a strategy for how Republicans could get a majority in Congress. And uh, at the time he arrived, they were 26 straight years in the minority. Uh, it took him uh, 24 years, I should say. It took him 16 years. The whole idea was you can't do this by having uh, district by district uh, uh, trench warfare because incumbents will always prevail and they know how to separate themselves out from the national issues. We need to create the sense that Congress is so corrupt, so illegitimate, so bad that people will throw up their hands and say anything would be better than this. And he provoked the Democrats in the majority, which wasn't difficult. They'd been there a long time. They were complacent and a little bit corrupt uh, themselves, uh, condescending. Uh, but he also used language and tools to get people really upset about what was going on. And when Bill Clinton became president, the opening was there. You unite against everything he stands for, delegitimize the president and Congress, and he got the sweep in 1994. But he brought with him a lot of people and had a lot of voters who really did believe that all of government was so awful and corrupt that if you blow the whole thing up, that'll be great. Now, Newt thought, he could turn around and say, no, I'm the speaker. This is going to be the most powerful institution in America. And it didn't quite work out that way. Pretty much a problem Republicans have had since. And I think, you know, the process Managing of... Managing an unruly... And, and delegitimizing <coughs> government yeah. itself creates an opening for somebody who says, how could I be worse than those bozos? Yeah. Uh, we have some polling numbers here. Just to, it's actually a much higher number than I thought. Yeah. Um, which has Congress at an approval rate of 17, which is a uh, little little Who higher. Who are than these 17 percent? <laughs> you wonder. Yes. It's been down to nine percent yeah. and 11 percent, something like that. But this is not a uh, uh, an institution that is respected at, at, at this point. No, that's uh, for sure, and that's history. true almost across the board. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, Newt uh, had a lot to do with getting that started. Uh, and, you know, he brought in a generation of uh, people, his uh, protégés. He gave them language to use. Disgusting, terrible, awful, despicable. He got them to despise everything about politics and politicians. Uh, and that meant they turned around and despised some of their own as well. The next item was um, the pay boost. Yeah. Um, and... Rush Limbaugh and talk radio as a general phenomenon that uh, uh, that fed yes. this. So you know, populism is deeply ingrained in America's DNA and uh, for good reasons. Uh, right from the beginning uh, in our culture, we distrusted those in positions of power. We didn't want power to accumulate too much. And it emerges often whenever there's stagnant economy or an economic downturn, 
But what happened in the late 1980s and early 1990s is basically uh, a conspiracy by the elites. It was the political elites. Ronald Reagan, as he left office, joining together with George Herbert Walker Bush as he came into the White House in 1989, all the congressional leaders, uh, and uh, basically they said, you know what, we have a commission consisting of financial and educational and religious elites that meets every four years <laughs> to look at the pay of members of Congress, judges, cabinet officers. They haven't had an increase in 10 years. They're falling behind. Let's make up for it with a 25% pay increase. It was just to make up for inflation over 10 years. Most Americans who are stuck in a stagnant world may be getting a 1% cost of living adjustment every year, looked at people making at that point, $87,000, which was far more than they were making, getting a 25% increase, and we got an explosion of populist anger. Rush Limbaugh had been a, basically a sports talk show uh, guy in California, Southern California. In 1988, uh, 1987, the FCC repealed the Fairness Doctrine. He moved to New York to try and make a national syndicated show, and the pay raise ignited him and basically created modern talk radio. That populist backlash reverberated for a very long time. So here you have the sort of the combining of a delegitimation of Congress coupled with them giving themselves a pay raise uh, as two initial sparks. And remember we had polls at the time that showed that a very substantial number of Americans thought that members of Congress lived in mansion, mansions, had liveried servants, drove around in limousines, had this five-star restaurant in the Capitol, uh, had the fanciest gym around, got all kinds of perks uh, off taxpayer dollars. Third factor is something that feeds off of conservative talk radio, and that's uh, Roger Isles and, uh, and Fox News. So Roger <laughs> Ailes is a genius, I think you'd have to say. He was a political genius back in the day when he worked for Richard Nixon then moved to business. Uh, Rupert Murdoch let him create Fox News, and Ailes figured out a business model that could work in the modern world where there were so many new choices. And it was a world where if you have an audience of two and a half million people, but they're the right two and a half million, and they keep coming back over and over and over again, you can make a lot of money. So Fox has more net profits with that audience than all three network news divisions with an audience of 20 to 30 million people combined because he saw that if you get that audience and the audience was conservatives who felt shut out of the mainstream press and hearing a message that the world was falling apart and you have a place where you can go to have your grievances aired was gold. And now they have that audience. We know that's not a huge group but we know it reverberates enormously. So the, if you ask conservatives, where do you get your news? Fox is by far the most dominant source. And if you listen to Fox, you're gonna get a very different picture of the world than if you listen to most other news outlets. And this created what the Clintons used to call the right-wing conspiracy because you had this um, sort of feeding of radio and uh, Fox News and some newspapers, the Washington Times and the, the, uh, the SCAF paper in, in Pitts, the Greenberg yeah. paper, um, that all fed each other until it then became a national story where it would be picked up by a member of Congress and they'd say, I read this, and then all of a sudden the Washington Post is covering it too. Yeah. Um, and so these are the initial sparks that sort of set the, 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 the sort of the context. It, it absolutely did, and you know, what's happened in the modern world now is uh, we used to, people of our generation, uh, get our news from three networks, and we were passive consumers. Mm -hmm. It was daily newspapers that would come in the morning or the afternoon, the networks. Now you don't have to sit there passively and watch. Uh, I remember when we got our first television set in our house, it was the first one in the neighborhood. It's a huge piece of furniture with a screen about that size. Everybody was mesmerized. But you had to, and younger generations don't even believe this was true, get up off the couch and go over and turn a dial to change a station. Now, of course, you can get whatever you want when you want it, 
and the people who want to hear what Fox presents uh, hear something that is a distorted view of the world. That's the nature of modern media. We see a similar phenomenon with MSNBC, with nowhere near the audience, but it defines things and it has also been a drum beat to delegitimize the opposition. Now, let's go to the, the one, because what doesn't help it are the other networks, and you talk about CNN. Um, and, and MS being a, an effort to replicate the Fox model, not as successfully. But CNN has done its own damage to the political discourse. Oh, very much so. And I think. I, I remember doing, I used to do Crossfire yeah. uh, a lot. Um, and the shows that I liked the best were the ones where we actually had a discussion, but the ones they liked the best were when it broke into an all out brawl. And basically nothing got heard. Sure. And I think, you know, in this world now, uh, finding a business model that works, that allows you to make money and have an audience, for cable news is a struggle. Now, uh, you know, as a general matter, when we first got 24-hour cable news, I rejoiced. I thought, at last, we're going to have opportunities for extended discourse, for real uh, discussion of in-depth of issues. And of course, it's exactly the opposite. It's quick hits. What you want is to have breaking news uh, running across the screen at all times. What we see with CNN is if there is a plane lost in the Pacific, like the uh, Malaysian Airlines plane, everything else gets dropped to cover that. And of course, what we also see is their definition of fairness, very different than Fox's, their definition of fairness is you put somebody who is at one end of the spectrum against somebody at the other to scream at each other, or you pick two political consultants who are spinmeisters, and what people hear is they don't believe anything, nobody believes anything, it's all a sham. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't help. Now, what they found is that Donald Trump is a way to bring eyeballs and to make uh, uh, news. MSNBC, very much the same. I uh, now call CNN TNN, it's the Trump News Network. And they will basically drop everything when a Trump rally I've comes up. I've seen the counter on the corner of the screen yeah. with number of hours, minutes, seconds to the Trump rally, yeah. which they're going to breathlessly uh, carry live. So the low moment was watching a discussion of how <coughs> they were overcovering Trump, which they broke into to go to a Trump rally. Mm -hmm. That's the world we live in now. But of course, what it's meant is that Donald Trump has gotten hundreds of millions of dollars of free advertising, sucked the air out of the room for the other candidates, and let his message which is usually done unfiltered because they show rallies from start to finish, dominate, uh, and they are unindicted co-conspirators in this process. And so the issue here is that they've not only not helped create um, a sense of objective news, but they've diminished the relevance of truth by saying it doesn't really matter. You come from the right, you come from the left. Both sides are about the same, and we're, we're interested in the exchange, not in what the, the storyline is. You know, uh, in some ways, this is a long-standing norm of journalism. You tell both sides of the story, uh, and it doesn't matter whether both sides are equally uh, weighted or one is uh, clearly here and the other one is way up there. You tell them both. And people are left with a very odd and distorted picture of reality. So one good example is climate change. Uh, CNN will have a discussion of climate change. They'll put on a scientist who says it's a hoax and a scientist who says it's real. And if you're not an expert or if you don't follow this closely, you're thinking, well, science is really evenly divided on this. But of course, that's not the case. And if you're watching, you're thinking, the only discussion in America, the only politics in America, is somebody over on the right and somebody over on the left. There's no center anymore. Mm -hmm. That's not a very good way to operate, to create <coughs> confidence in the system. Compounding this is the role of the internet, um, which has created too much information and people end up self-selecting the information they want. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, an, it's an odd phenomenon. Uh, for people like me and you, this is the most wonderful world imaginable. I can sit at my desk and not move and have more information at my fingertips than the entire federal government, the Pentagon, the State Department, and other agencies would have been able to access 
20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, I don't have to worry about finding something in a book anymore. I can do it without leaving. I can get everything that I want or need in history and in contemporary stuff. But for most Americans, it's like a flood coming over you. And you handle it by looking very selectively and going at things that you want to hear. And then you get it compounded by the amplification of social media, where people will get emails uh, or texts or go to Facebook and they'll say, hey, read this. It just came in from the internet. It must be true. So you even have, I mean, here's an incredible element of the phenomenon. Donald Trump gets up at a rally and says that a protester who had uh, gone to get on his stage, who'd been taken away by the Secret Service, was connected to ISIS, which turned out to be a hoax. Trump's defense was, well, hey, I saw it on the internet. How am I supposed to know? That's what most people get. And what it means is you not only get a distorted view of things because you end up with a whole lot of information that is self-selected, but you end up with a lot of things that are simply not true. But if you see them, and especially if they're sent to you or referred to you by friends or relatives, you believe it's true even if it's not. And we end up in a world where you can't argue policy based on a common set of facts. You have different worlds of facts, and that's really difficult to end up with the kind of deliberative democracy the framers expected we would have. And so this tendency on the part of Mr. Trump um, to not always tell the truth, or most frequently yeah. not to tell the truth, to say something one day and then say, I never said that, even though the quote's there for all to see, um, works for him because people are, in effect, filtering out the, the dissonant information and following simply a path that is supportive of a view they already have, which is the media isn't telling the truth about Donald Trump. The truth is Donald Trump always tells the truth. And Trump has created or uh, taken advantage of a world where he knows that you can lie and get away with it. Yeah. And he knows that those media who put him on if they call him on this and call him on this repeatedly, will be seen by Trump supporters as going after him. Uh, so he gets the best of both worlds uh, through his dishonesty. Now, this brings us up to uh, the turn of the last uh, administration from Republican to Democrat, which was the Wall Street bailout. Yeah. And it wasn't just the bailout, but it was the people who were instrumental in sort of guiding the last two administrations in policy, who were themselves Wall Street figures. And it's so interesting, Jim, to look at the parallel with the pay raise, where you had financial elites, you know, the people in New York uh, and part of the financial world who were on that quadrennial commission that recommended a pay raise, looked at members of Congress making $87,000 a year and said, you know, how can you live on that? Uh, now what you had was something far more serious than a pay raise because it came at a time not just of economic stagnation but of economic collapse. And what happens? The two uh, parties conspire together again. Uh, the outgoing president, and this happened on his watch, George W. Bush, his Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, the two presidential candidates, John McCain and Barack Obama, all the congressional leaders of both parties, get together and say to the American people, we got to bail out this industry because otherwise we're headed for a global depression of enormous proportions. Now, the bill that they proposed with urgency failed in the House. House Republicans showing that this sort of populist anger at elites was already building said no. The Dow dropped precipitously. They voted for it. But the reaction of the public at large was, so these political elites get together, all the politicians, and they bail out the miscreants who got us into this mess, and then give them bonuses. What do we get? We lose our houses? Or the one big asset we have, the savings in our house, declines dramatically. We lose our jobs, or we're stuck in limbo and can't go anywhere. And 
you get this explosion that ends up with populism on the left with the Occupy Wall Street movement and on the right uh, with uh, the Tea Party movement. And that has fueled an enormous amount of this populist anger. And when you get populism, it brings with it uh, distrust of leadership at all levels. It brings with it a good dose of isolationism, which we're now seeing really expressed pretty overtly by Trump, of protectionism, which we see with Trump and with uh, Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. among many others, uh, <coughs> and most significantly of nativism. Mm -hmm. Back uh, when we had the pay raise, it was the emergence of Pat Buchanan on the right, Ralph Nader on the left, and Ross Perot in the middle. Remember the giant sucking sound of jobs going to Mexico. That was protectionism and nativism uh, wrapped up into one. Now with Trump, it is a much more crude and blunt instrument, but the bailout is what created this atmosphere that makes it possible. I want to skip to the end of your list for a minute because uh, I look at the election of Barack Obama as an, an additional contributing factor. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost as if an entire class of people, middle-aged, middle-class white uh, folks, were losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing the sense of the American dream. Their pensions were collapsing. Yeah. And a young black guy uh, gets elected president who the polls showed this constituency, this, this demographic said he cares more about them than he does about us. Uh, and the Tea Party grew out of this. And Trump is the inheritor, I think, of the, this, this sense of betrayal. And I, I think uh, Trump <clears throat> is a marketing genius, marketing himself, but he also understands what sells. And he mm -hmm. saw this phenomenon. And we have these very interesting surveys now, uh, including uh, of all the Republican candidates and who's supporting them. And when you ask the question, uh, who do you think is, uh, is suffering under the current uh, regime uh, from discrimination? Is it minorities like African Americans and Hispanics, or is it white people uh, who are being uh, uh, passed over in favor of the others? And Trump's supporters, far more than any others, are in the latter camp. Mm -hmm. These are white people who believe there's racism, and racism is on the rise, but it's against them. And of course, Obama is a symbol of all of that. It's ironic because in the African American community, there is some resentment of Obama that he hasn't been a president for African Americans, mm -hmm. that he's tried to be a president for everybody. But to the Trump constituency, that's not the case at all. So let's go back again, because yeah. there was, as part of this Tea Party phenomenon, yeah. there were what are called the young guns. And yeah. This is a, a class of people elected to Congress in the wake of the Obama election that brought with them a very different uh, agenda even different than the, than the Gingrich agenda, yeah. harsher. Uh, but, you know, taking a lot out of the playbook of Newt, you know, a couple of things we know. Uh, one thing we know, Jim, is that uh, the Republicans suffered uh, an across-the-board defeat in 2008. They lost uh, the presidency. Uh, the Democrats ended up with robust majorities in the House and the Senate. And Republican leaders, many of them, met on inaugural eve January 2009. They were demoralized, they were disillusioned, they were depressed, and they had a dinner just a few blocks from where we are at the uh, Capitol Grill, and, uh, or the caucus uh, room, I should say. And they came out ebullient because they'd figured out what they were gonna do, which was they were gonna act like a parliamentary minority party, unite together, vote against anything that Obama proposed, even if they'd been for it before, and try to delegitimize him and all of the actions taken by Democrats, believing that at least when the midterms came up, people would be so upset at the failures of governance, make every win ugly and have some losses, that they would have a backlash, just like Newt got in 1994. So we had uh, Kevin McCarthy, Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, three young leaders of the Republicans in the House. They did a book called The Young Guns, which of course was taken from a movie with Kevin Costner. There was a picture just like that on the cover. They didn't even mention uh, uh, the speaker their, or their, uh, uh, their leader, John Boehner, because they were a new generation. 
But what they did was not only pursue that strategy in Congress, they went around the country, fanned out to recruit candidates from the Tea Party, and said, you know what, if we can get back into majority in the House, we will use the debt ceiling as a hostage and force Obama to his knees. And we will repeal Obamacare and Dodd-Frank. And then we will force government uh, uh, back into the position it should be in, which is a minor player in the world. And we will uh, give you a down payment to show we're serious. Give us the majority. We'll cut $100 billion right off the top. And it worked like a charm, right? They had the best election that they'd had in 100 years in all the states. They won the House. All these Tea Party members get their first meeting they have. Paul Ryan, the budget guru, comes and says, you know that $100 billion we promised? Well, the fiscal year actually began October 1, and it's now January, and we're not going to be able to finish until April or May and get it implemented, and we have to prorate it. So it's, it's $100 billion, but it's actually going to be 35. And they're thinking, this is Washington speak. Then, of course, they failed on the debt ceiling. They failed to get Obama to repeal much of anything. And then they were told, well, he's a one-term president. The American people have had uh, the reality placed in front of them, this Kenyan socialist. And he wins re-election. And they still don't get what they mm -hmm. want. And then it's, well, we're out number two to one. We take the Senate. And they took the Senate. And they still don't get what they want. So a Trump comes along and says, they're captives of this uh, ruling class. I know, I've been one of them. I've bought and sold these politicians, just like the financial people did when they got the bailout. And I know how to bring all of that to an end. I'm not going to be bought by anybody. And how can you trust them? And so the phenomenon which goes beyond Trump to Trumpism is through this entire season, when Republicans, whether it's all of them or registered or active, were asked preferences for president, 60 to 70 percent chose outsiders or insurgents. 20 percent chose the figures who we would see as establishment figures. This is a larger phenomenon than Trump, but Trump has been the one who's exploited it brilliantly. There's one last item you have, and that is the role of Citizens United and huge amounts of money yeah. changing politics. We're not going to have time to talk about it so much because I want to ask you one last question. Emphasis. Where do you see the weight of this uh, in this equation? Trump or Trumpism? Trump the person or the social and political and psychological context? Um, is Donald Trump the mover of this or if there were no Trump there'd be somebody else doing it? Uh, and if, we've got it just a minute, yeah. sorry. If there were no Trump, it might be that Ted Cruz, whose calling card is everybody in his party hates him and he called his own leader a liar, mm -hmm. might be the one to emerge. But Trump is going to be around as a factor for a long time. Trumpism, which is nativist, uh, isolationist, and has a lot of racial elements to it, uh, is not going away anytime soon. And the Republican Party really faces an existential threat yeah. because there are a lot of values that they don't want to predominate that make them an all-white party that can't survive for the future. And Trump has taken them down a path that's a very, very bad one. And, of course, not and, doing great things for the country. And their own history over the last 30 years have brought them to this point as well. The, the basic point here is this is a self-inflicted yeah. wound more than anything else, Jim. Thank you so much, Norm. Sure. Uh, that's all we've got for now. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's AAIUSA or on the web at AAIUSA.org. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint. Mm -hmm.